This video is designed to present a teacher's point of view of why I am teaching, what am I teaching on the subject of industrial instrumentation. This course is a part of third year curriculum of Bachelor of Technology in the Department of Electronics and Instrumentation Engineering. Instead of diving straight into the lecture, this video will map each topic of syllabus with a social scenario to give the students a bird's eye perspective on learning and thinking for oneself. So what is industrial instrumentation? It is an application of instrumentation and its concepts to the industries. We are all consumers of industrial products and services. Thus, industry must necessarily employ and ensure the appropriate standards and procedures in all stages of the product design and development. In order to understand and appreciate industrial instrumentation, let's consider the scenario of an aeroplane design. Let's take a closer look at the aeroplane design from a broad perspective in this scenario. The first thing you will notice when you look at an aeroplane is its wings. There is a reason for the long wings. The lift of the plane depends on its wing span. The wing length is calculated very precisely based on the standard aspect ratio of the body. If you go inside a plane, the size of the seats are meticulously measured and standardized because it is important for not only passengers comfort but also due to the dimensional constraints on the airplane. So length measurement from largest of the scale to the smallest plays a vital role in airplane design. Moving on, once the wing is designed with a proper length, a detailed surface profiling is done which checks the plainness of the wing surface. Any deviation from the standard values can cause a momentum loss during the flight. This image here shows a plainness and roughness profile of a plane wing. So we will learn about the plainness and roughness measurements. Let's look at the turbine engine. Unless we know its diameter, we cannot design the propeller blades. So knowledge of diameter measurement is important. Next to the wing again. You must have noticed that the wings are not parallel to the ground but are raised by a certain angle. This is called dihedral angle which is necessary for an aeroplane to be unable to take a stable turn during a flight. Before moving on, let me list down the measurement topics we are covering. So in unit 1 of your syllabus, we will learn different techniques and ideas dealing with industrial measurements of length, roughness and plainness, diameter, and fourth one is angle. Moving on to the wing again, but this time from the top. You see an aeroplane wing is not a single piece. It has various components in it, like slats, flaps, ailerons, spoilers, etc. Each come in different shapes and sizes. As you can see all these different colors. While designing these components, thorough steps are followed for individual area measurements as they must all work their way up in building the final wing assembly. So area measurement. Next, an aircraft cannot take off without certain velocity. It must also maintain proper velocity in order to be stable in air. The velocity of the ground vehicle is estimated by measuring the RPM and considering the wheel diameter. However, an aeroplane wheel does not have such reference with the ground. A special measuring device, pitot tube, is used for airplane velocity measurements. Moving on, an aircraft must maintain proper orientation all through the flight and particularly when turning in mid-air. The flight data recorder, FDR, uses the accelerometers to measure acceleration along the three axes of the aeroplane, the pitch, the roll, and yaw. A gyroscope is used for this purpose. Next, we will look into a special device called comparator. The various components of the aeroplane are mass produced once they are designed. However, it is important to ensure that the components are manufactured faithfully corresponding to the design. Comparators serve this purpose of ensuring that all design principles are applied appropriately in production. 
Here is an example of a comparator applied to the size and shape of wheels to ensure that all wheels are designed uniformly. So next in your unit 1, we will learn measurement techniques for area, velocity, acceleration and lastly the comparators. This is the first unit of your course. Let's go to the second unit. Force balance is a crucial aspect of aerodynamics and aircraft design. The four forces, weight versus lift, thrust versus drag, must balance out in order to maintain the stability in mid-air. As you can see in this image, these forces are measured and tested on a model. Next is pressure measurement. Flight witnesses lower pressures at high altitudes which results in breathing problems for cabin crew and passengers. Thus, airplanes must maintain relatively high pressure inside the cabin. Also, let's look at the wheels here. Hydraulic actuation system is used in the landing gear to provide necessary suspension during taxiing, takeoff and landing. So in this part of your syllabus, you will learn different principles and techniques for measuring high and low pressure in industries. So in the second unit, we will learn measurement techniques dealing with the different forces and then different pressure measurement techniques. Now unit 3. Let's think about fueling system in aeroplanes. Proper flow rates are maintained during the fuel filling at ground. Also think of aerial refueling system. Here a low flow rate is maintained to avoid any air turbulences on the fuel channel. So we are learning techniques of flow measurements as a part of the course. Now let's move on to the fuel tanks. You can see in this image, the fuel tanks of an aeroplane are spread out uniformly along the body of the aeroplane and its wings. These tanks must be filled uniformly either on the ground or in the air so that the fuel reserves do not cause an imbalance of the aircraft. The fuel tanks in the aeroplane are connected to each other in such a way that they allow uniform distribution of the load when the aircraft is taking a turn in the mid-air. Fuel levels are thus constantly monitored to ensure that fuel is being consumed by the flight without unbalancing the aeroplane. So in unit 3 we will learn about different floor measurement techniques and then various techniques used for level measurements. Moving on, let's think about the density measurement. Air density is one of the most important aspect for aerodynamics. The lift and drag forces are directly proportional to the air density. Air density decreases at higher altitudes. It is tough for a flight to maintain stability of forces at higher altitudes. All commercial airplanes thus have to comply with a flight ceiling, which is the maximum height at which an aircraft can fly safely. The onboard density meter in an airplane monitors its flight ceiling at high altitudes. Also at these high altitudes, temperature drops drastically. Thus the fuel flow can get restricted due to the icing of fuel pipes. Anti-icing fluids are added to the fuel to avoid such problems. These anti-icing fluids come in different viscosities. Thus, viscosity measurement is crucial in deciding an appropriate anti-icing fluid. The next one is quite obvious if you have heard any airplane. The engine and wind noise during a flight can be deafening for both passengers and the crew members if proper soundproofing is not done. Next is humidity measurement. Air density decreases with increasing humidity. Thus, aerodynamics of the flight are affected when humid air replaces the dry air around the aircraft. All aeroplanes use humidity measuring devices for cabin humidity control. This ensures the proper oxygen supply to the passengers and also prevents fungi and bacteria growth inside the cabin. So in unit 4, we will learn about different measurement techniques for density, viscosity, sound and humidity. Finally, the last unit of this course deals with the calibration of measuring devices. The performance of instrument degrades or alters over time due to the normal wear and tear. 
Any instrument is only as good as its latest calibration procedure. In industries, measurements are frequent, constant, or continual. Thus, wear and tear can be more frequent and ignorance towards the same can be catastrophic. So, in the last section of your course in Unit 5, you will be learning calibration and interfacing techniques for the measuring instruments that we have learned in the previous sections.